So welcome to class today. Um, today we're going to be talking about transfer learning uh, with a supervised and an unsupervised perspective. Uh, here today we have William Falcon, a expert in uh, the tools we are going to be using for explaining to you how this stuff works, which is going to be telling us a little bit more about this topic. Okay. So William, uh, the floor is yours. <laughs> Uh, Alfredo, thank you so much for having me here and excited to share this with the whole class and everyone. So, okay, uh, today we're going to be doing self-supervised and supervised transfer learning. So this is going to come up a lot for people. So if you work in an industry or doing any kind of research, you're going to run into something where you may not have enough data and you need to have some model that's been trained on something uh, else. And then you can use that to kind of jumpstart your process, right? So we'll cover it in the context of computer vision today, but uh, this can transfer to NLP, um, speech, anything you Answer. want. Answer learning. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Uh, pun intended. <laughs> and, um, and some of the mains may not work as well, but you know, I'm, I'm confident that in the next few years, I'm sure we'll figure, figure out a way to do that. So the first thing I'm going to do is someone install lightning, right? Hmm. Um, and, uh, and Lightning is a lightweight wrapper for PyTorch, for high-performance research, right? So if you're using PyTorch, it basically organizes your PyTorch code so that you can leverage things like multiple GPU training, TPUs, and, and different things that require a lot of expertise um, and, frankly, are things you don't need to deal with when you're trying to work uh, and, like, you know, build models. And the second framework that I'm going to install is Bolts, right? So Bolts is our other framework, and it is for... Hyper, um, it is for, it's like a research toolkit, basically. So I can't find my mouse. There it is. Okay. Um, so it's a research toolkit. So mm -hmm. if you ever wondered, uh, if you're starting something, or, you know, it's also used in industry as well, but if you're starting a project and you're looking for a model and um, you don't find one, um, you can look for in bolts, right? And then this will be one, maybe possibly one of the latest models, but it's already been implemented, tested, and documented so that you can start from a good good spot. So you don't have to sit here and try to implement the baseline yourself for three months to see if you get it right. Um, you can just kind of subclass and build on that. And Bolts has a pretty robust library of self-supervised learning. It's a lot of stuff that, uh, you know, it's personally done in my research as well and things that we've implemented from the latest papers. Okay, if I would like to learn more about these things, where can I find more resources? Yeah, so you can go to Lightning Repo, right? Okay. So this is, um, I mean, I think probably the easiest thing is to go to PyTorch lightning.ai here. Okay. So we have the, the landing page there. And then oh, wow. we have everything, uh, documentation, videos about lightning, about the team and everything else. And then there you can click on docs, right? Mm. And then go straight to the docs, get started here in the lightning in two steps, read this. And at the end of this, you should know everything you need to know. Again, if you know PyTorch, this should take like four minutes to understand. Um, okay. because it's, Where's the, the bolts? Yeah, and then Bolts is going to be, um, let's see if we have it on the page as well. Um, let's see. Yeah, so we have a Bolts here. So okay. you can click on that and then visit Bolts. And then this is its own documentation as well, right? So you can click on it, look at the introduction guide, and then we will walk you through the main ideas about Bolts. So Bolts is a newer project, so it is faster moving. Um, so it will change pretty frequently. Uh, Lightning is is 1.0 is stable, so um, you know feel free to use it for whatever you want as well. All right. Okay, so um, installing this, I believe I'm in a GPU instance. Um, yeah, the cool thing is with Lightning, you can actually use TPUs and GPUs, but I'm going to use GPUs right now. TPUs mm -hmm. are dodgy sometimes. <laughs> uh, okay, so the first thing I want to cover is like when do you want to fine tune, right? So I, th I think that there are certain things you can ask yourself to understand if, if what you're about to do is, you know, it's useful for fine tuning. So let me paste this image here. Uh, so I made a little diagram for everyone. Okay. Okay. Thanks. So let's start with the green spots, right? So I think the first question is, do you have a lot of data? Uh, if the answer is yes, then you likely don't need to fine tune, right? Now, do you also have time and compute, right? You can have a lot of data, but if it's super costly to train, then uh, you're you're gonna want to find something pre-trained. But if you have the money and the and the time and the compute, then just go ahead and train on your data, right? And when you're done, run in your test data set. Now, if you don't have a lot of data, 
then you should try to find a pre-trained model for your data that matches your data distribution, right? So this is super important because most vision models are trained on image nets, right? So if you want to do something like, I don't know, cancer detection or x-rays, that, that's unlikely going to transfer, right? Because an image net, you don't have that kind of data. You also don't have people, right? Um, so you have to you have to be mindful of what you're using this for. So you know it's it's not just blindly the the magic of a neural network is going to work. And then, um, so yeah, so if you if you do have something that matches that kind of distribution, then you can use a pre-trained model, right? So when you think about transfer learning, we have two parts. You have the pre-trained model that was trained on something else, and then you have the stuff you're going to add on top of that to uh, to transfer that, right? Um, and then you can fine tune in your own data. Uh, so, so this is very important. So I would keep this in mind. And um, and then and then the next things are, are this, right? So then you have two major options. You have supervised or self-supervised, right? So on on a model that was that's pre-trained using supervised training, learning uh, was trained likely for classification. So something for ImageNet, for example. Um, and by doing that, you've introduced bias into that model, right? You've, you've forced it to learn a representation that is going to make classification easier, but there's no guarantee that that's going to make something like segmentation or um, detection or anything else as easy. Um, and, and so you want to be mindful of that, right? So the self-supervised, um, I, like I said, it's experimental, but it might be, I might be able to generalize better. So it was not trained for classification, which means that if you want to do segmentation or object detection, um, the representations uh, might might transfer better. So um, so that's interesting. And then um, you know there are like I don't know if you're following the literature, or probably not, but there are about seven or eight options that you have to do this. So AMDIM, um, Moco, CPC, Perl, SimClear, BYO, and Suave, right? So in, in order, the latest one is Suave. Um, and if you're interested in understanding the difference between all of these. Um, you know, I, I recently published a paper with uh, with Professor Cho um, a few months ago, and then we wrote this article, um, kind of going into all the details and how to how to compare all of them, and you know what 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 the differences are, because they're really not that different. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna be using Suave for this particular case for our our self supervised transfer learning. Okay. Um, so the first thing is I'm going to. The, the first case that we're going to look at is going to be this supervised transfer learning. So this is likely the case that you're going to run into an industry most of the time, right? So you have a small data set of images and some compute budget. Um, and in this case, we're going to pull out a ResNet 50, right? So there are many ResNets, 18, 50, one, whatever, 101, 152, but 50 is kind of like a sweet spot. It's not so big that it's super expensive to train and it's not so small that it won't do anything interesting for you. Um, remember, this was pre-trained on ImageNet, and it was pre-trained. It was pre-trained for classification. And ImageNet is a data set that has a thousand categories. Each of them has a thousand images, so it's like one million, uh, roughly one million images, right? So that's that's why it's actually very successful because you know this huge amount of uh, data allows us to distill a very uh, a model that has a very good prior in terms of natural images, right? Because it's been like those thousand classic classes are uh, names of natural like objects. So that's why usually it works quite well. But nevertheless, as you pointed out before, if you want to uh, use a network for medical images where <laughs> the you know statistics of your images are completely different than what they are in an image net, then it's completely like hopeless to have you know, any kind of decent result. Nevertheless, let's start with what is, you know, commonly done for normal images, right? Yeah, so I think um, I think to start, you know, we, we can, we're using this library called Torch Vision, right? So by, by the PyTorch team as well. And um, in there, we have a bunch of pre-trained models. So this one's a ResNet 50. Um, so I'm gonna set this to true so I can, I can load that model, um, which, it's going to download, I assume, some weights. Uh, great, okay, so there are the weights. And then uh, now we can use this to run predictions, right? So let's pretend that our you know, data set that we will actually care about um, has 10 classes, right? And those classes are like frog, horse, whatever. 
so we I'm cheating because there's this data set called CIFAR 10, right? So CIFAR 10. And this data set looks like this, right? So again, okay. there are there are tiny images, they're 32 by 32 pixels and three channels for color. Um, but you know, it's it's a useful toy data set. It's better than MNIST, um, especially because you're using pre-trained on image net and like I'm pretty sure on ImageNet, there are not a lot of fake digits or handwritten digits, so <laughs> it wouldn't transfer super well. But there are dogs and cats and birds and all that stuff, so same kind of domain. Uh, sorry, same kind of category. Uh, yes, great. So let's uh, let's use that guy. So we're gonna set up our our data set, right? So let's let's pull in um, CIFAR10 uh, again from Torch Vision. Yep, and then we are going to use these transforms, right? So um, something that's useful normally for these cases is to normalize your image. So we're gonna make it uh, zero mean and then one for standard deviation, right? So we're gonna add this on here and I'm not gonna add it right now because I wanna actually plot the image for you so you can see what it looks like. Mm -hmm. um, so I do this and then that will actually download, oh, I need to import that transforms, right? Um, here from Torch Vision. Import transforms. Okay, so this is going to download, extract, and then we have this data set. Great, so that's ready to go. So let me just plot it now. So I'm just gonna copy paste some matplotlib code to do that. Um, and I'm gonna also plot the label, so show you what the label is. Mm -hmm. um, and there you go. So you can't really tell, but that's label. Oh, well, it's a it's super nice frog, I, I yeah. can't tell. It's beautiful. <laughs> Yeah, like a red and orange eye. Uh, but if you look at label six, I mean, let's just verify, right? So zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. So yeah, that looks like, a, it looks like this guy, kind of. <laughs> uh, yeah, so so that's the frog. So let's normalize it now. So that's okay. connected to the neural network. Oh, it's already downloaded. Okay. Oh, wow. See, now okay. it's different. Um, so that's great. And um, cool. So now, now we, we don't want to iterate through these images like one at a time, right? So see here, this is an image, mm -hmm. uh, a single image. So we actually want to do batch of images, right? So we're going to use a data loader for that. So I pull that in and I'm going to say uh, batch size 32 and I do want to shuffle that. So there it is. Um, and then obviously, you know, to iterate through this, it's just a simple for loop, right? So for batch in data loader, get the batch, expand it out, print the shapes, just so we can see what they look like. So 32 is the batch size, which is great. Mm -hmm. Three channels, 32 height, and 32 width pixels, right? Um, and then our labels are 32. So just 32 scalars. Um, and then um, now we're gonna, I also need to modify my rest net. So if you remember the rest net was trained for image nets. And as you said, there are a thousand classes there. So it won't really work when I have a data set with 10 classes. So for that, I need to modify my rest net 50 to take that. So um, I think they're cheating because actually the rest net 50 has a rest net 50 plus these FC fully connected layers at the end, right? So um, we're going to replace that last fully connected layer, which I don't know what the size of the, the output is of that rest net 50, um, but I know that I need to have 10 as the output because that's going to be the number of classes that I have, right? Mm -hmm. So what's happening under the hood is you have this like rest net, right? A bunch of layers here. And then at some point when that ends, then you have this fully connected, which is mapping the output from here um, yeah. into whatever number of classes you have, right? So this guy I want to replace. Um, you yeah. know, depends on the context. You sometimes can drop it, put an identity function, whatever you want. Um, okay, so we'll replace that. Let's just make sure that works. Okay, perfect. So now we're good to go. Um, so let's go ahead and predict some stuff, right? So I'm just going to load another batch here, and then I'm going to run it through my rest net, so this image, and then I'm going to look at the first 10 predictions only, right? Um, great. So that, that looks good. Um, and I noticed that the, high, the highest number is this first guy here, right? 0 0.7 looks like. Um, so let me do a soft max just to kind of like turn these into probabilities, right? Um, great, so 0.19, uh, that looks like the highest one. So this is what the network would predict for this particular image, the label. And uh, we're gonna use the arc, arc max to pull the like 
the, the label name, I guess, in this case. Um, so we get zero, right? So that makes sense because that was the highest number as well, right? Um, and there are 10 here. So where, where do we feed the image to the network? Oh, up here, um, right there. Uh, but X was a 32 by 32, right? And the ResNet usually is trained on the 100 and something, right, pixels. So yeah, how does correct. It work? So it's convolutional though. So um, it, it, the inputs don't really matter as long as you don't shrink it too much, right? So I'm cheating a little bit, but um, the CIFAR 10 is fine. 32 won't, won't disappear. If you did like MNES, potentially you could have a crash because at some point you'll downsample way too much. Uh-huh, okay. Um, so yeah, so it's a beautiful part about the rest nets, sorry, about convolutional networks as, you know, the input can change, um, as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. So let's put the, the labels. So I pulled the labels out, um, and they don't match, right? So obviously you're like, well, this is supposed to be this fancy pre-trained image net model, but like it didn't predict the labels. So my labels are seven. I predicted zero. Uh, none of these, none of these are great. It's a, this one by chance. So one out of 10 makes sense, right? Expect the number given the classes. Um, yeah, so they don't match. So the, the reason for that is because we haven't, remember we replaced this layer here, right? Mm -hmm. um, where is it? Yeah, here. Uh, mm -hmm. Nope, not there, here. So we replace this layer. So like all of the last logic, if you replace anything in this pre-trained model, it's not going to work, right? And the last logic we, we made completely random. So now I have to fine tune this thing. So the process of fine tuning is, um, you know, you can do it two ways. You can take, this pre-trained net, net network and keep it kind of frozen, right? So you're never going to backpropagate into it and then strap anything else on, on top of that. I'm going to use a linear layer, but you could use an SVM. You could use logistic regression. You can use a random forest, any classifier. It uh, doesn't matter um, because what you're doing is you're using the neural network to extract features and then you're using some other classifier um, to use those features and classify, right? And if the network did its job, they should be linearly separable. So then that SVM would be fine at that point. So um, I, in this case, I'm going to be lazy. I'm just going to use the linear layer, right? So I'm going to actually separate them to make this more clear. So here's the backbone, okay? So I'm not going to mess with anything about the FC layer. I'm just going to create a completely separate layer now. So this is, I'm going to call this a fine tune layer. And I'm just going to take whatever the output features were of that backbone. Um, FC, and then I'm going to map them back to 10. So I'm just adding another layer now. Um, so uh, in bolts, so in Lightning, we have this concept of um, data modules, right? So uh, notice I only have a train split for CIFAR 10, but I actually want like a validation and test split. And like, you know, it's just going to be super annoying to do it myself and split them up. So I'm just going to use this data module that we have, right? So the data module is literally just going to be three data loaders. Right, so it's going to be a train, a val, and a test data loader, and then it has within it all the splits and everything you need to care about. So let me show you what I mean by that. Um, so I'll go to the documentation. I'll go to the vision data modules, um, supervised learning, CIFAR 10. So they're here, and I can look at the source. Mm. So here's the source code, and now I see that you know there's a bunch of pr preparation and all the kind of like boilerplate stuff is taken care of for you. So I'm just going to get a data loader with the train splits, a data loader with the validation splits, and a data loader with a test split. And I don't have to deal with any of this other magic. But it's just a PyTorch data loader. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use this guy because uh, I want to save us all a bunch of time. OK, so let me just code this up in plain PyTorch real quick just to show um, you know, the basics of this. right? So I'm going to import uh, an optimizer and then our last function here. And um, I'm going to use Atom, but I'm, I'm not going to, I don't want to update this backbone because as soon as I start updating it, um, it's going to lose kind of its representation. Yeah, right? yeah, okay. I just want to use a fine tune. just doing the classifier. Yeah, just the classifier right now. So I'm going to do that. And then I'm going to just iterate through my, you know, I'm going to set 10 epochs here. And then um, again, this is the data loader. I can just use the data loaders directly, right? This is, you can use them in PyTorch. So I'm just going to pull the train data loader out and then I iterate through here. And then I'm gonna run uh, the input through the backbone. I'm gonna get a bunch of features, right? So I'm going from batch by three by 32 by 32. So channels, height, and width pixels to batch by 1000, which is the number of classes on ImageNet, but we're gonna treat this as embedding dimension here. Um, 
And, you know, I, I don't have to do this uh, because my optimizer is only looking at this fine tune layer, but I'm going to detach here, right? So I could just attach it here. So it doesn't matter. I'm going to, I'm going to comment this out for now. Um, but I just want to show that like, if you were training both at the same time, you could just detach the features and pass them into the classifier. Yeah, yeah but I, actually I would recommend you to do like, uh, if you go to a couple of lines above, uh, if you click under the X, uh, below the x x comma y equal batch the just below oh, yeah yeah one line below okay there we can one line yeah we can write with torch dot no grad oh sure there you go so I'd, i would prefer this actually no right. underscore grad parenthesis and colon yeah right. and then we indent that feature so this is basically not um telling pytorch not to track the the computational uh, graphs right so it's going to be uh much faster and also, hold on, I think it's going to be, not sure faster, but it's going to be not taking any additional memory because we are not going to be doing deck propagation through the backbone, right? So this is usually, uh, this is the best practice, I would say. Right. Yeah, it makes sense. I know, again, but I'm only optimizing this guy, right? Um, yeah, yeah. So, but yeah, to, to your point, you won't keep a graph when you do this, which is definitely more efficient. Um, okay, so then, um, where, where's my screen? Okay. So we have the features, and then we're going to run them through our, our fine-tune layer, right? So um, this guy here. So again, this fine-tune layer could be like you know an SVM if I wanted to do, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. Um, but here I'm using this linear layer that I created up here. OK. So I'm going to run it through the fine-tune layer. It's going to give me the predictions. Um, I guess it would have to be differentiable in this case, <laughs> but that's OK. Um, and then I'm going to calculate the loss, right? So cross entropy. So I'm going to pass in the predictions and then the labels. I There's think. a space missing. Hold on. Yeah. What's yeah. Going on? <laughs> <laughs> I like that we both tune in immediately to be like, why is that off? Yeah. <laughs> um, and then, you know, the standard uh, backward optimizer stuff, uh, optimization stuff. Right. So we'll do that. Cool. Um, and then, uh, you know, I I'm just going to print the loss just so that we, uh, we know where we're at. Okay. So I'm going to run this guy and hopefully you'll start seeing the loss coming up. Let's see. There it is. All right. It's something's happening. The magic is happening. Okay. So I'm going to stop this because it's super slow. Uh, we're using a GPU machine. So I, I kind of I want to use this GPU. So I'm going to, I'm going to just convert this into lightning real quick. Um, and that, that process is going to be super fast because I'm just organizing what I did. Right. Okay. So, um, I have all the same stuff there. So, the first thing I'm going to do is just create this lightning module, right? So this class here um, and PL, we imported at the top, right? So it's just lightning. Uh, did we import it? Yeah. No, we didn't import. Okay. We just uh, installed it. Yeah. So let me just import it then. So okay. I can import PyTorch lightning as PL. Great. So this is the same basically as an NN.module, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it's just lightning. So, and then... Um, I'm going to change things a bit, right? So I want to kind of, I need to call this first. Oh, sorry. So I need to uh, write our init function. Yeah. Um, I write this so much nowadays. <laughs> okay. So, and then I'm going to init uh, our super class. Oops. There you go. Um, great. And then um, I want to use that backbone, right? So I'm just going to bring that guy in. Where was it? uh here so you know i'm, I'm just going to define it in the model mm -hmm. here solve that backbone um and then i want to also use this linear classifier guy where are you here okay so here's our fine tune layer great same thing perfect okay um and then I want to parameterize this a bit, right? So this 10, I can make this more general. This is an image classifier. So I'll just say num classes, right? And we'll default to 10 because um, it's going to be for C part 10 mostly, but I can just do that. And then, uh, so that's it. And then uh, now the training stuff. So this is where, this is what's going to abstract away the training loop so that, you know, we don't have to deal with all this boilerplate code. Um, so this training step is like the forward in a modern? What is it? 
Yeah, it's kind of like a forward, but instead of just doing kind of like a forward pass of computation, so let's you define all the interactions of the model, the loss, and everything else, right? So it's capturing like a full system. So if you were to do BERT or GAN or VAE or something like that, all of that logic would happen in training step. So it's easier to understand and, and keep together. So what, what does this uh, method has to return? Um, so you have to return a loss, right? Oh, so, okay. I see. Yeah, and uh, I'll, I'll show that in a minute, but it has to have a, com a computational graph attached to it uh, so it can do uh -huh. the optimization. So uh, where do we have all that? It's literally just all of this stuff here, right? So I'm just going to copy. Oh, so, okay, so your training loop that we wrote before in, uh, in, uh, in PyTorch, it's, it's go, it goes inside the model now? Yeah, exactly. It's a little bit interesting, but what, what it does is it makes it so that your model self-contained, right? So in, in this version, you, mm. it's not reusable. Like I can't reuse this code for like a different task tomorrow. It's like very specific to this thing. So I'm just pulling out the relevant stuff, which is what, you know, what we're going to spend 99% of our time on is modifying these. So we're going to, we're going to like, you, you skip a few things there. You just selected half. So what about the last part? Yeah, so that you don't actually need, right? So Lightning is going to do this for you automatically. It's going to call oh, okay. backwards, the step, and the zero grad. Um, there's a way that you can enable it if you want to, but and you can do it yourself. But you, we're going to use something called automatic optimization, which is enabled by default in Lightning, where it's going to do it for you. You can turn that off, and then you just call it yourself, and that's fine. Okay, okay. So otherwise, we just have to specify basically... Uh, what the loss is given a batch. Is it correct? Correct. Yeah. Okay. So let's let's do that. Um, so I okay. paste all that. So nothing changed. I'm going to remove this thing here because, I mean, you know, you can leave it if you want, I guess. Doesn't matter. No, no, leave it. Why, why, do, you, why do you want to remove it? Yeah. Well, because I, I want to change uh, eventually so that we can actually fine tune the backbone. But we'll leave it for now. We'll, we'll make that change later. Okay. So this is self up backbone now, right? So let's just change yeah. that. Backbone, and then this is self dot fine tune layer. Uh huh. Cool. Uh, that should pretty much have all the same stuff. And then I return this loss here. Great. I see. Okay. Um, and then the last thing is so so a lightning module is like a recipe for a model, right? Like or like a class or whatever you're trying to do. Here's a classifier. It's not it's not a model, right? It's just like a general classifier. Um, but the last kind of ingredient I need is this optimizer, right? So I need to know what optimizer I'm going to use. Yes. So I'm yeah. Gonna return that. Um, and there's a, there's a method called configure optimizers where I specify that. Mm. So these names are, I believe, uh, private names, uh, training step and configure optimizers. W where do I find them? How do I know what are these names? Yeah. So those are on the documentation, right? So when you go through here, uh -huh. uh, lightning in two steps, it'll ask, okay. it'll walk you through it and I'll say, this is what you need to define training step, configure optimizers. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and then, and forward is optional. I'm not using it, but you don't have to use it because we're not using this model for predictions. Um, so I don't have to actually define it. So 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 if we if we would use this model for prediction, you actually would use the forward. Yeah, correct. So in this in this demo, I'm, I'm using an autoencoder. So in this particular uh -huh. case, I wrote the autoencoder to generate embeddings when you use it. So I, I just wrote up the forward to do that. Um, but the I training see. the training step is separate. Okay, so we have the the the, finite, the init that is basically uh, defining all the modules inside. Then we have a forward, which is, as you said, used only whenever you may use the model, but we don't necessarily need. Then there is the training step where we define uh, how the loss is computed given a batch and a batch index. And then finally, we have this um, configure optimizer, which is specifying the uh, optimizer we're going to be using for you know, adapting the parameters of the network. Is it, did I, did it, did I correct? It was yeah, it correct? That's exactly correct. <laughs> All right. Okay. Okay. Makes sense. Makes sense. Then. Um, so I'm going to use that optimizer, right? So Adam, uh, I, we have it up here. I uh, just, copied. okay. Um, okay. So, you know, in, when we did it up here, we were just passing in that fine tune layer, right? Um, you don't have to do that. So I'm just going to call self here and that's going to just pass in all of the parameters, right? And, and that's okay because the backbone's disabled because it's no, no grad thing. So it's going to be fine. I'm not actually going to backpropagate into it. And then I'm going to make this learning rate. I think like this. Uh, and then I need to return this optimizer. Don't forget this <laughs> or you'll get random noise. Okay, so that's literally it. So I, again, this is the same code, 
it, but now it's like vastly less boilerplate, even for such a simple project, right? Um, and then uh, now to train this, uh, very simple. So I'm just gonna init my model, right? Oh, actually I forgot one thing. So this learning rate, I kind of want to tune it. So let me just make it a parameter, right? Okay. And then um, let's do that here. Negative three, and then I'll pass it in self.lr equals that. Great. So I think there should be some very nice trick, I believe, in a uh, lining that I don't have to type this. Yeah. Self -dot. Can you, can you tell point. So we have uh, save hyperparameters, I believe. Hyperparameters. Yeah. Um, okay. So you don't actually have to. Now, when I do this, I don't mm. actually have to go and say self dot num classes equals x self dot lr equals whatever, right? Mm. Um, this I don't have to do this anymore. I can just add this stuff directly. Okay. Um, so I can call it here. So it's 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 saved under this thing called hprams hyperprams, right? Uh, okay. So you just access it there directly. I see. And and this is useful because you know in most models you have like thirty parameters, right? So you don't want to do this manually. <laughs> um, okay, great. Now just to train this thing, it's very simple. I'm just going to init that model, right? So how do we train this stuff? Yeah, so we have this... Um, so remember all the stuff that we got rid of? So mm. epoch, batch, optimizer, whatever. That's yeah. all inside this trainer that um, basically handles all the engineering for you. Which, so, which trainer? Um, so it's here, right? So this trainer is here. Oh, uh, I see. You we haven't it. explained yet. <laughs> yeah. So, so in the Lightning library, you have you only have two things you need to know about in Lightning, right? Um, okay this trainer and then this lightning. Uh, That's what I mean. I see. So the trainer is uh, like literally your, your, for your simple training loop, right? So let me just show you. So lightning module finds mm. that, and then the trainer is here. So lightning API. Oh, okay. The main APIs. Um, oh, see, I see, I see. Okay, also there's just two there. Yeah, that's it. Okay. And then um, I think we have even a pseudo loop so you can understand how, what it's doing. Uh, let me see, where is it? Yeah, I think it walks you through it, um, doesn't it? Mm. Okay, but I think I, I, I got it. So I, I just go to the uh, docs and then there is the API and then there are the two things that you mentioned before. There is the uh, model and then there is this trainer, which is training the model, which makes sense, I think. Yep, and yeah. then here's the, the lighting module tells you the same thing, right? Um, mm -hmm. okay. And then actually, I think it is the lighting module where you write the loop. Yeah, so here you go. So it's showing you here under the hood. Lightning's going to do this. It's the same. Oh, okay. That we wrote here. Um, okay, okay, okay. That that was my question actually. So this is exactly the thing that we wrote on the uh, on the notebook, right? So we have the uh, model train, and then um, wait, wait. you go back to the documentation. <laughs> All right. So the other one. Yeah. So we have the model in the training version, right? In training mode. Uh, then we enable the gradients, uh, and then I guess there is this. Um, uh, saving the uh, yeah, yeah. is getting the, the output of the from the training step, which is going to be the loss. Then okay, we compute the backward pass, and then we step, and then the zero. Okay, yeah. Um, and as you see, you were passing. Oh, there's a bug here. This should just say batch here, right? <laughs> okay. um, but yeah, you're just passing the batch directly to the training step. Okay, so we're back here. So that was training step configure optimizer. So we're good to go. The trainer is going to do this. So on mm. Colab. Um, tends to tends to freeze because the update happens very fast. To um, so when, when you start training Lightning, it's going to print a little progress bar, and it's going to overwhelm the screen. So we want to slow that down. So let's change that to call it ten, so that we're not freezing. Actually, twenty, so that we're not freezing the screen. Um, and then we also need the model, um, our classifier, right? That we just wrote. So here we go. This guy. And then we're going to, I like to swap these. So I'm going to add them here. There you go. Okay. And then I'm just going to so put the that. trainer is a class. Uh, yeah. So right now it's an instance of a class. So trainer mm -hmm. is. Okay. Class. So I'm going to create an instance of that. I'm going to call them fit. And then I'm going to pass in my classifier in here. Uh -huh. right? And then uh, we have the data. So uh, as I mentioned, I have just this train loader. So I'll show you first this train loader. So I can pass that in. It's not a problem. Um, so I'll pass in the regular PyTorch data loader, and then this will just start training, right? Oh, and wait, wow. He's also using the 
GPU available true, used false. Ah. Yeah, and actually we give you a warning. We're saying, hey, you have a GPU, but you're not using it, right? Uh, so we, we give a good experience there. Anyway, so you see this thing is training. Um, I'm gonna use that data module, right, that we created instead. So I just passed that in. And it's gonna be the same effects, right? So you don't have to deal with it. It, it knows to pull out the training. Um, oh, okay. The training splits. Um, okay, so it's going, let's give it a few seconds. So also here, TPU available. You can also use TPUs, you said before, right? Yeah, correct. Wow. Okay, so I'm curious. I'm just gonna use the GPU though. So we have the GPU um, and I'm not gonna change my code. I'm just gonna set GPU is equals to one here. And now we're training on a GPU and you will see that it's much faster now. <laughs> oh, wow. So Can we try as well on the TPU just for sake of curiosity? Uh, we no. can, um, it's just, you have to install this XLA library. Oh, okay, okay, then next time. Okay, sure. Yeah, yeah. So the, the, the caveat with TPUs is that um, Google is working super hard to make sure that they can support, and, and PyTorch together to support uh, TPUs. So mm -hmm. the, the experience is not quite there yet. You still have to install this XLA library. And if you go to the Lightning docs, it'll show you. Um, but yeah, once you do that, you just change this to, uh, I think it's TPU cores. And then you set it to one or eight or whatever you want, and then you'll be training on the TPU. Um, okay. And there are plenty of demos on the on the website to show that. Okay, 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 okay. Just just to be sure that. It, yeah, yeah, I just I want to keep this one focus on the train. Okay, okay, fine, fine, fine. <laughs> uh, okay, so wait, well, we were talking to train. So see, the loss is at one point nine five. Oh wow, cool. super long. So let's just see what happened. Um, so let's see uh, let's see how it learned so far. So Lightning creates logs for you automatically, and I can just launch TensorBoard to visualize. Oh wow, really? Impressive. Yeah, do anything. Um, and here we are. TensorBoard shoots up, and now you see. Uh, oh, you didn't log anything. Yeah, so we have to log something. <laughs> okay. How uh, do you? So let's log. Let's just log this loss, right? So I'm gonna say self dot log, and then I'll say train loss, pass in the loss. Uh, I also want to do the accuracy. So let me just pull out our fancy metrics library from PyTorch lightning dot metrics dot functional import accuracy, right? And then we're going to also log the accuracy. Self.log. So self.log is something, uh, is a method in the model? Yeah, so it's a method of the mo of the lightning module. So uh, what's cool is that self.log, so you're training on one GP right now, but when you start training on eight, uh, 200, whatever, you have to sync logs across GPUs and you have to like, you know, calculate metrics correctly. Like you can average accuracy, but you can't average something like ROC or something like that. So Lightning handles all that distributed stuff for you and syncing and, and when to do it um, if you use self.log and everything else. Uh, I think you made a mistake there. Uh, so this is something that I think every time uh, it's, it's very, it's very like tricky mistake. Uh, you didn't disattach, uh, detach that loss, right? So it looks like you're, you're saving, you're logging the whole computational graph there. In oh the no, so, so when you log it, Lightning will detach anything. Oh wow, really? Yeah, you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> nice, okay. So nice, uh, yeah. We try to make sure that you're, uh, we, we keep you from making mistakes. <laughs> as much okay. As we can. Um, okay, so, so let's log. So we're training, we're logging the training accuracy as well now, and then the training loss. Um, yeah. So we have this warning here. So we're, we're not validating right now. So Lightning is saying, Hey, oh. you, you pass in about that a letter, but you haven't implemented a validation step. Right. I so see. we only have a train loop and it's saying that because the data module has a validation split attached to it. Right. Oh, um, yeah. but that's okay. I don't want to validate right now. So I'm just going to train to see what's happening with this fine tuning thing. Okay, so. uh, otherwise, if you were using like the old, the, the other previous version, the one with the PyTorch dataset, uh, you had to set, you had to pass both the training and validation separately. Yeah, so you'd have to do this and then pass in a val loader. Oh, I see. Okay, so you had to send them separately, but inst instead, in this case, you send like a class which yeah, contains. Right. I see. Okay, makes sense. Uh, okay, so what is that? An epoch and a half? Great. Let's see what happens. <laughs> um, let's reload this guy. Oh, did it load already for me? Nice. Maybe I don't have to reload it. Let's see if TensorBoard did its thing today. It didn't. Okay, so I'm gonna have to reload it. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna zoom out for a second. Okay, this, sure. This is huge. 
All right. So Epoch. Oh, wow. Okay. Did one Epoch and a half. Fine. Uh, let's look at our train accuracy. It's all over the place because it's training, right? So you want to, you want to, you mostly want to be tracking your validation, like Epoch accuracy, but uh, we know it's high. Like without doing anything, we're already at 28%, which is great. So it shows the transfer learning is working. And then our loss should be going down. So it's kind of bumpy, but that's expected. Um, again, because this is the training curve. Um, so yeah, so now we're seeing the logs of this, which is great. Um, so now that we have this stuff here, I actually want to, I actually want to unfreeze this rest net after a few okay. epochs, right? So we're sure. gonna find we're gonna fine tune as it is right now, but um, after let's just say ten epochs. I'm going to say, hey, unfreeze the backbone and start using the backbone as well. Yeah. So the, yeah, also with a different learning rate, usually I do that. Yeah, so you can adjust that as well, right? So I'm going to do, I'm, I'm going to skip the learning rate adjustment, but let me start just by changing the, the epoch thing, right? So um, the, the, the lightning module, no, the trainer, yeah. So lightning module has a pointer to the trainer, and then the trainer knows what current epoch it's in, right? Oh, okay. Epoch. Um, as long as it's less than 10, I'm going to do this stuff here, right? So hold on. How how does the network knows about the trainer? <laughs> yeah. So when you when you start this training process in here, yeah. uh, in FIT, then the trainer, the network gets assigned the trainer and then it knows oh. what it's in. Yeah. Okay. 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 Sounds it's cool. So, so only, only um, well, okay. So in real life, you would like, wait like 10, 20 epochs, but right now because we're limited. I'm gonna put one epoch. Actually, create feature of lightning. Let's change it here. So you see how long this epoch is taking right now? Because I'm going through yeah. 1400 samples. Let me just actually limit the number of training batches so that we can go through more epochs faster. <laughs> so okay. I'm gonna go through 50 training batches, that's it. Um, and, then, um, and then actually I can do this realistically. So I can say 10 epochs. Um, so as long as the epoch is under 10, I'm going to do this where there's not, there are going to be no gradients. Um, as, as soon as you're out of that though, right? So wait, I need an if statement. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, here. So as soon as you're yeah. out of that, I'm just going to actually pull out the features, right? Okay. So now I'm going to be back propagating to this thing. Um, great. Uh, okay, so I just made some changes, and I'm not quite sure if it's going to break. So I'm going to use a, a quick debugging trip. It's called Fast Dev Run. So I'm going to turn this on real quick. And when I when I enable this, it's going to hit every single line of code. Um, and then it's not going to train. It's just going to do one batch very quickly just to make sure that I have no bugs. So let me just run that real quick. And if this completes, I have no problems. Okay, great. No bugs. <laughs> so it's okay. like the compiler. Um, if, if I had a bug wow. here... If I had been like asserts false, right? Yeah. Then um, it would catch it without having to train the whole time. Great. Oh, so, wow. Okay. Okay. I see. Okay. So, um, so real live debugging here. Uh, okay. Perfect. So I'm going to disable this thing now. And uh, I don't need 50 batches. Like I'm just being ambitious. Let's just do 20. That's fine. And then this should power through the epochs a lot faster. Okay. Great. So that was one, one epoch. So you see it's going super quick. Um, and it's kind of kind of like weird because this refresh rate is 20. So it's only going to look at every 20 bucks. So let me just change that to five, sorry, batches. So every five batches is going to up get, up, update this bar now. Um, okay. Um, we have 10 minutes left and we still have to cover the unsupervised learning just to let you know. Got it. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. So here, um, so let's see, epoch two, epoch three, epoch four. Um, so you see the losses going down nicely. Mm -hmm. um, so let's just keep it going for a minute. And then it's going to unfreeze at some point, And then the loss is going to drop a lot more. Now, as you mentioned, you have to lower the learning rate as well. I'm not doing that. So I'm not going to get the best performance out of this. Um, but you can do that as well. How many how many ebooks does this stuff go for? Um, oh, by default, a thousand, right? You can, you can set a max limit or something. In the trainer initialization? Yeah, uh, here. So I see. Okay. Max box, I think it's called. Uh -huh. Okay. 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 It's going. Um, yeah, it looks like that didn't work because this loss is high now. Um, maybe it starts working now. So yeah, had I adjusted the learning rate, that wouldn't have happened. It wouldn't have jumped and lost. Um, it would have just been fine. But I think it's adjusting now. So uh let's see what happens. 
Oh, it's also 50 batches. So that, that will explain some things as well. Okay, there you go. So now we're, we're under two, which is great. So we, we hadn't seen that before. Um, and so we're dropping faster. So let's just show the loss now uh, okay. on the chart, just so we can see what the effects were. Luckily for self-supervised learning, uh, not much changes. You only change the backbone. So it should take a few. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, so the last two that we cared about were these guys, right? So this was not frozen and this was, no, sorry, this was frozen backbone and unfrozen backbone. Mm -hmm. So let's see what happened. Um, yeah, so you can see the training accuracy at some point started going higher once the, the unfreezing thing happened. Um, also trained a lot longer for sure. So, and it's, we didn't say a seed, so it can be the random minute as well. Um, and then the train loss as well. So it kind of starts going down and this jump up here is because of the unfreezing part, right? So that's when that happened. Actually, I think it's around here, but it was already lower at this point, um, obviously because the train longer, but unfreezing tends to give you a better performance over time. Um, but I think it's really specific to your task. So let's use self-supervised learning instead. Um, All right, so we have like five minutes for this last part. Yeah, so instead of using this ResNet 50, I'm just gonna use a swap model, right? So. All I'm going to do now is I'm going to look at bolts and I'm going to, I'm going to load those models, right? So here is the path, right? So you just have to give it the weights path and you can find that in the docs, right? So it's just bolts. Show me, show me. What is this swab thingy? Yeah. So swab is one of the latest methods coming out of fair. Um, so it's just bolts. So I'm going to look at self-supervised learning. Oh, okay. Have contrast so all the methods here. I'm going to use swab. Um, and then I have the image net baseline here. And then I, I know I can load it through here. So I can just copy paste this, right? Is there also a link the, to the paper somewhere here? I believe so. Let's see. Yeah, there it is. Oh, okay, okay, I see. Um, and then you can, uh, you know, so it's adapted from the official implementation. We actually worked with Matilde to do this as well. So okay. it's, it's super helpful. And um, And yeah, so here's the, Here's, I'm just going to copy this, right? So I can All right. yeah. do this. Uh, sorry. Apparently my mouse doesn't work. Okay. Um, so that's all I need to do. So I'm going to bring that guy in. And uh, I'm not, I don't need to freeze anything. So I get swab here. Great. So it's going to load the checkpoint for that. And then swab has this model inside it, which is the backbone, right? So I just need to pull that out. So swab.model. So that's going to be the backbone of swab. Um, and then Swab in particular outputs 3,000 features, right? So I'm just going to change that to 3,000. And then um, in this particular case, um, Swab, this model also outputs two feature maps. So I just want the last one. I don't need. But don't this need is a pre trained model, is it? Yeah, it's a pre trained model, correct. But um, it's pre trained on uh, images without labels, is it correct? Yes. So it's sub supervised. So it was pre trained on ImageNet without any labels whatsoever. So the idea. So hold on, here, so before we were doing, so we are doing transfer learning and before we were doing transfer learning from supervised learning using a network train on ImageNet. Right now we are doing still transfer learning, but using a network that has been trained on, we don't know what, but without labels. Correct. So maybe that it's nice because I can pre-train my uh, SWOV model on my own data. Yeah. which I don't have many labels, for example, and then I can just train the classifier with a few labels I have, right? Yeah, that's a good point. So if you are, I mean, if you're working at a company, most likely you're going to have your own data set that has, you know, it might, might be massive, but it will cost a lot of money to label. So you don't need to worry about it too so much. Maybe until this stuff works really well, you might have to, but, um, you know, you can try this out and then um, pre-train unsupervised on that. And then um, and then use that. So yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Um, okay. So we get the backbone, three thousand features. Uh, again, this particular model is going to output two feature maps. Um, it's just the way it's trained. So I just want the last one. I don't want both, right? Um, so I, let me just make that more clear. So features equals features negative one because this is a this is actually an array. Actually, let's call it feature one and feature two, right? So I just want the second one here. Okay. And then um, I'm going to do the same thing here when it's unfrozen. 
Great. Um, and I believe those are all the changes I need to make to get this to work. So that is it. That is the extent wow. of modifying <laughs> for self-supervised learning. I told you it was going to be under 10 minutes. <laughs> I'm, imp I'm impressed. I, I never actually done this myself. Um, so let's see. I don't have to change anything uh, now. Let's see if this works. Oh, there it is. look at that. Now wow. <laughs> No way. So we can actually, if we let it run a little bit, we can also compare performance, right? Later for the... Uh, yeah, I mean, look, it's already lower. It's it's at two already. Like the other one didn't even get this low before. And it's not even unfrozen yet, right? So, yeah, I don't know. It's interesting. <laughs> wow. Okay, okay. Oh, this is impressive. So let's, let's wait a little bit and then we can uh, yeah, compare, I, mean, I guess. It's below two already. And you know, the other one didn't get to below two until we unfroze the model, right? Um, now we're about to unfreeze it because it's layer 10. So let's see what happens. So now we drop. So this one even didn't spike. This one didn't go up to three point something. It just started to go down. So, you know, it's 1.4 now. It's working much better. Like, I don't know why that didn't spike. Like, I think that obviously this is an open area of research. And like, you know, I think most of us in in the lab are like working on this as well with uh, with Kyung Hyung or Jan. I but think the, the spike the, the spike might be uh, coming from the fact that that model final learning rate was tinier, and now that we are making it a larger one, maybe we escape from that uh, small from that kind of minimum we we were in, right? So I think perhaps it's it's a good theory. <laughs> I mean, I'm just assuming. That I don't know if I'm right. yeah. I mean, I, I would. Uh, I have no idea. I mean, I think you're, there's there's definitely an aspect to that. Um, I think I would say something like, um, I don't know. I don't, yeah, I think that's probably the most the most reasonable explanation. <laughs> I want right, so I want to say that it's about self supervised learning, but I can't say that with full certainty. <laughs> all right. So let, let's let's compare the performance of these two uh, of the last one. So we had to refresh the tensor board, I guess. If he come back, comes back to life, there we go. <laughs> All right. So uh, the last three are the ones we care about. Uh, just the last two, I think, is enough. Seven and eight. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Okay. Because so the six was not trained, I think. Supervised, and this is unsupervised. So blue yeah. is unsupervised. So let's see. They all. They can, both can we actually? Can we change the name of this version two, three, four, such that we can put some more descriptive, descriptive thing? Or yeah, you can. You can. Okay. Um, you can. It, the docs will explain how to do that. Okay. Um, okay. So train accuracy, uh, unsupervised. <laughs> wow. Okay. Unsupervised. Uh, okay. And then the train loss. There you Whoa. go. Okay. Okay. You convinced me. All right. And so we have seen how to perform a transfer learning with a, a pre-trained backbone first with a supervised pre-trained backbone, then with a self-supervised pre-trained backbone. But then what is the advantage of using uh, this transfer learning? So generally, we're going to be able to kind of get a jump start on our training, right? So we're going to be able to sometimes converge a lot faster, but second, be able to generalize to the data set that we were training on. So remember, we had this data set that the model was not pre-trained on, and we're hoping that we can generalize to our test uh, split of that data set, right? Um, so as we showed right now, we only train on the training split. So that's great just to make sure things are working, but you want to know if you're going to do well when you see actual data, um, which we're going to use the validation set for. All right, so let's see how we can validate uh, our networks, right? Yeah, so let's let's do a quick recap, right? So we have, this is the supervised model, right? Mm -hmm. So this was using our standard ResNet50 backbone. And then below I have the self-supervised model. So we just swapped that with the swap model. Yeah. So um, let's go ahead and train the supervised one and we're going to do it for uh, 20 epochs. And we're, we're not going to limit the number of batches. We're going to train on the full uh, thing so we can see what happens, right? Um, so I'm going to set max epochs equals 20. And since we want to do the valid validation, I actually need a validation loop as well, right? So okay. here, uh, the you know, simplest way to do this is just copy paste this code because it's largely the same. Mm. And then I can just reword this, call a validation step and then uh, replace these words with val and val. Right? And these are also um, keywords, right? For the PyTorch lining, this validation underscore step. Exactly. Okay. 
And what you notice here is that, so I, I want to make a point. So in training, you want to log something every batch, right? Um, in validation, it doesn't really make sense to log something every batch because they're independent. So you want to you want to calculate the accuracy or the loss across the whole epoch. So you don't have to deal with that um, as long as you just use log lightning nodes to do it the, the correct way. So it'll aggregate across the epoch as well. Okay. Um, now this stuff is we don't really need this. Uh, it doesn't hurt to have it, um, but you know we could we could simplify things by just getting rid of all this. Since there are no gradients already, they're they're disabled or in validation automatically. Um, you know, so so we can just simplify this. Okay. Um, and then, um, yeah, so we can leave it here. Now, you'll also notice that this code is largely the same. So yes, you could uh, write an intermediate function and then just use the same one, but you know, just for simplicity, we're gonna keep it as it is. Okay. Um, okay, so let's now train for 20 epochs. And you'll notice that it will run a few validation batches first to make sure you have no bugs. And now we start training. Okay. Okay, so we're done training. So let's see how we do. 20 epochs. <laughs> okay. Um, let's uh, reload this guy. All right, there's our 20 epoch model. Let's see what our validation accuracy looks like. Uh, not bad. So. Um, you can see, let's look at the epoch where that happened, right? So you can see that change. So around step 14,000, we had this big increase in, uh, in accuracy, validation accuracy. I'm going to guess that's where the model was unfrozen, mm -hmm. right? So let's look at that. That's step 14,000. Um, and 14,000 around here. So yeah, it's about step uh, epoch 10. So the ninth, the, the 10th epoch, right? So it's index nine. Uh, so yeah, so that makes sense. So you so you can see that um, unfreezing the backbone at some point uh, will then enable you to kind of reach the next plateau of performance. So let's right, do that. This was for the supervised pre-training uh, part, right? Yeah, and then let's, let's also look at the loss. So this is by epoch. So you can see as well that that happened there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one thing you could try is also just unfreeze it from the get-go. You might be able to do better as well, but. Let's do the exact same thing with the self-supervised version. Okay, so we need to add the, the validation method to this one as well, right? Yeah, so let's just do that. Let's copy, again, like we did, we're just going to copy the training step. Oh, we already had the training, the validation, right? Yeah, and then I'm going to rename this to validation. Oh, okay, you can copy from the previous. <laughs> yeah, well, it's this slightly different because we have these two feature maps. So. Oh, okay, you're right, I forgot. Yeah, so val, val loss and then val act. And again, this no grad thing doesn't matter, but I'll remove it just to make things cleaner. Um, great. Okay, so now we should be able to train on, and I, I wanna make sure we're using the exact same training regime, so I'm just gonna copy paste this guy here. Okay. So this is gonna train on 20 epochs, and now we will use the validation sets. So this is suave, uh, self-supervised. Okay. So okay. we are down here with the training. All right, let's see how it did. Mm. So this is experiment number one. So let's look it up on this tensor board. It did not upload automatically, so let's refresh. Okay, version one, great. Let's look at the validation accuracy. Oh, oh wow. Much better. So, in blue, we have the self-supervised model. Mm -hmm. And in orange, we have the supervised model. So they might converge at some point, but what's interesting is that um, it reaches a higher accuracy much faster. Yeah, right? yeah it's so, impressive. So it's great. So I think this is you know something promising about self-supervised learning is that it should help you get um, speed up your convergence. So it'll save you money, basically. <laughs> I so see. let's train it without any of this, just to show what happens when you don't have um, any of these pre-trained models. So I can do that by just turning this guy off, right? So I'm not gonna load weights. So and by then... default is false? Correct. Okay, can we check? Yeah, so we can just set it to false. Okay, that's better, thank you. Okay. So let's also go ahead and remove this uh, unfreezing part mm -hmm. um, and just train it with it unfrozen from the very beginning. Yeah. So we'll just delete this. All right. Okay. Uh, let's see how it goes. 
So here we actually, uh, let's remember that we are training the full backbone uh, and therefore we are doing back, backward, uh, like forward and backward through the uh, backbone. So it's taking way too long. So we are gonna be stopping uh, right now at epoch 10, so it should be just fine. And let's compare now the validation curves. So refresh the uh, TensorBoard. All right, do you have a guess for the best accuracy for that model? Uh, I hope, no, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think I do, but I want to see. I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> then getting like, Okay, oh, no. let's see. Oh wait, sorry. There you go. Uh, it's going up. I mean, you know, it's just standard, right? So it's very slow to converge. Um, it, it probably will get there at some point, but you know, the amount of compute that was required to get this one is a lot, but a lot cheaper because you already had this strong prior. Um, so yeah, it's good. I mean, it's not bad. So actually with the blue curve, if we actually do like one step only, we just get immediately to 80%, right? So if we, I think even if we don't do the uh, training of the classifier at the beginning, and we just do one step uh, directly everything, we get immediately at a very good initial point, right? Yeah, so if, you, if we leave the fine tune layer, if we just leave everything unfrozen and just kind of start from there. And so this was trained with roughly 50,000 uh, training samples. But let's see what happens if we are really pushing hard and using really few label samples. So I want to show you this uh, really cool function in the Torch library called random split. So if you have a list of, you know, if you have a data set, for example, uh, here I'm pretending I have a data set, it's just 10 numbers. Um, I want to actually split that into two sets. And I want, I want them to shuffle first and then make that split. So in this case, I want the first set to have three elements in it, and then the second set to have seven. Mm -hmm. And what's cool is that I can make this deterministic by adding the seed argument to it. So let me run it once just so you can see. And so you see in the first set, we got 261. And then when I run it again, still the same thing, right? Okay. So why is this cool? Because that's what we're using under the hood on the data modules, right? Yeah. So um, here we have the default seed for the data module so that when you're doing this data loader, um, we're gonna take the CIFAR 10, the CIFAR 10 training split, and then we're going to split that split into two, right? One is the train and one is the validation, which we're not using there. Mm -hmm. um, so we're gonna use that because I, you know, this this argument here about split is saying how much, how many validation um, elements do I want, right? So in that case, when I run this, I'm gonna have here. I'm gonna have uh, 50,000 minus, you know, 100, 1,000, whatever we want. 50,000 is the number of elements in the training split of CIFAR 10. So I'm saying, okay, if I wanna have 100 training elements, then I need to set that to num train, and then, then I'll use 50,000 minus 100 validation samples. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so we have that. Um, so again, we had we already have the models defined, right? So we have this, um, so we have three models that we're going to test right now. The, the pre-trained model that was pre-trained using self-supervised learning. Yeah. Then the pre-trained model that was pre-trained using supervised learning. And yeah. then a model that is not pre-trained. Yeah. <laughs> so let's go there. And we don't freeze, right? Uh, in this case, the backbone. Yeah. So we're going to unfreeze the backbones mm -hmm. um, and okay. we're just going to train. So, the, you know, just to kind of summarize, this is the training step yeah, yeah, sure, sure. features and then fine tune. So no freezing. So let, let's look at three different numbers of examples, right? So let's pick a hundred train samples, 316 train samples and a thousand train samples. And then we're going to validate only on a hundred batches of validation so that, you know, we can speed up. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna loop over this number of train samples here, mm -hmm. right? And then I'm just I'm just plotting some stuff here that we want to know. So I wanna I wanna set the max epoch. So I want to make sure we have the same number of steps everywhere. So we're gonna set um, we're gonna limit everything to have five thousand steps, and then um, we're gonna derive the the max epoch from that, right? So which is this guy? Yeah. And then we want to check validation not on every epoch because it's going to be too slow. We're going to do it every five. Um, 
well, we want to check it five times within the number of training epochs. So this is going to tell us how often to check the validation. Mm -hmm. um, and then we initialize the data, right? So again, just the data module. And we're going to pull out the training data loader just so that we can print the length. So we know how many training samples we're running. And then uh, the model, right? So we're going to, in this case, use the model that was pre-trained using self-supervised learning. And then because I want to modify what it's going to show. So you asked me earlier, how do I change version in the TensorBoard logs or whatever I want? Yeah. Um, I'm going to actually initialize the TensorBoard logger and then set the name myself here, right? So it's going to be SSL dash, you know, the number of training that we're using. So it'll be SSL dash 100, 316, and then 1000. Um, and then everything else stays the same. The only other thing I'm going to add on here is that uh, I only want to check 100 validation batches, right? So limit val batches equals 100. And then again, I don't want to check the validation on every training epoch. So I want to do it every, you know, any box. In this case, it's going to be derived automatically. So um, just to make sure that we are consistent across splits. Okay, uh, so we're going to train this, ready? All right. Okay, so we just trained the self-supervised model. Mm -hmm. um, let's go ahead and train. We're gonna do exactly the same stuff that we just did. Uh, so I just copy pasted the code from above, yeah. but now we're gonna use our supervised model. So the ResNet 50 with pre-trained weights. On the um, so let's data sets, right? Correct, on the image okay. net. Um, and then we're gonna train this guy as well. And uh, you know, I'm naming that one supervised dash the number of training samples. Um, so let's go ahead and train that. Okay, great. So we just trained the, the supervised uh, ResNet. And uh, now we're going to train just the random model, right? Mm -hmm. So here, there's nothing pre-trained. It's everything training from scratch. Um, so it's this guy here. Yeah. And then we're going to call it supervised, not pre-trained. So let's go ahead and train those. All right. Okay, so... They're all done training. Um, are you, why don't we just look at the logs? Uh, what do you think will happen? <laughs> uh, let, let's see, I don't want to spoil it. <laughs> okay. All right, cool. So I'd like to see the accuracy for the uh, validation set, if you can show me. All right, yes, let's pick out the ones that we want to show. So these are all the supervised, um, not pre-trained, right? And then the supervised, and then we're, these are the self-supervised ones. This was just a trial as well. Okay, yeah. so these are the ones we want to compare. So at the bottom, these guys here, these are the random ones. So nothing's pre-trained. So you can see that on average, we get like, you know, okay, we get in the teens of accuracy here. Yeah. And then in the middle, guys, these are the ones that are supervised pre-trained. So the rest net. And we get in the you know, 20s and 30s, um, which is great. Uh, so you can see that the transfer learning works, right? So yeah, automatically. Twice, twice as much performance, right? Exactly. And what's interesting is that when they're trained without labels, these guys, we get double the performance of the models that were trained with the labels. Wow. Impressive. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I guess we can't generalize too much from, you know, ImageNet to CIFAR 10, but... Uh, to me, this is a, this is super promising as well. <laughs> All right, so let, let, let's let's give again the the punchline. What is the the point of today's lesson? What did we learn? Where did we start? So we started with introducing to you the concept of transfer learning. Uh, we covered the supervised version and the unsupervised version. Uh, here, at least, we concluded in this tiny uh, experiment that the performance using the unsupervised version are much better than we don't know whether uh, this is, you know, <laughs> a, a actual result that generalizes. But the point is that the unsupervised learning um, version allows us to train a backbone on our own data, right? Rather than, instead the, the supervised learning, you need to actually have annotated data, which is expensive, right? So this is actually a very big, um, a very big, point, right? Such that if you need to do uh, something in a practical 
um, aspect that you have a company or whatever, and then you have plenty of data. Uh, you don't really necessarily have the labels because we said plenty of times those are expensive. You can still pre-train your backbone with those unsupervised uh, algorithms that are already available to you if you use the bolts, right? So everything is already coded and and checked with the authors, I think, and they compared like in terms of performance, uh, not only in the accuracy, but also in the computations, I think. Like, I think this lining has so many, um, you know, checks for being able to maintain a very, uh, you know, high speed, you know, it doesn't slow you down to, it doesn't slow you down. And so again, we have all those uh, unsupervised, self-supervised learning algorithms that are, you know, coming out, you know, just recently, like this year, they were from July or June, whatever, 2020. And they're already available here in this library. Uh, we can use them for training, uh, for training your model on your own data. And then we simply swap in a classifier. We just put a classifier on top of the network and then fine tune this uh, classifier or even the other weights using those labels we have, right? And so this was basically the summary of today's lesson. Um, anything that I, that I missed? No, I think that was perfect. All right, thank you so much, William, for being uh, with, with us today. Uh, it was really great. I really learned so many things from you. Th thank you for having me. This is, this is great. I hope, uh, I hope this is useful for everyone. I think it is. All right, have a good evening or day or afternoon or morning, whatever the day you're watching this video. All right, bye-bye. <laughs>